simply flooded the system with money. Yes, we did. That's another way to think about it. We did. Where does it come from? Do you just print it? We print it digitally. So we, you know, we, as a central bank, we have the ability to create money uh, digitally. And we do that by buying treasury bills or, or bonds or other government guaranteed securities. And that, that actually increases the money supply. We also print actual currency and we distribute that through the Federal Reserve Bank. It's Lucy and Jeff going for walks and talks, talk about banksters and Bitcoin and COVID and stuff. It's Lucy and Jeff and tacos and kisses. Lucy, I can't believe you're outside without your mask on. Aren't you scared of the cornholio? Eh, that's all government propaganda, you know that. And besides, I get lots of vitamin D and plenty of vitamin T. Well, I made a joke about it a couple of days ago saying that uh, I'll bet they say, what's his name, George Floyd has COVID. <laughs> and, yep, and as they say, who is it, the Illinois health person said, anyone who dies having COVID will be marked down as COVID. If you were in hospice and had already been given you know, a few weeks to live, and then you also were found to have COVID, that would be counted as a COVID death. It means that if, um, it technically, if even if you died of a clear alternate cause, but you had COVID at the same time, it's still listed as a COVID death. So um, everyone who's listed as a COVID death doesn't mean that that was the cause of the death, but they had COVID at the time of death. Oh my gosh, we got another COVID death. It's so, so terrible. You know what a real epidemic would look like? I would be doing these videos very somber. I would be like, oh, I just had another friend just died. Oh, people in my family are dying. Oh, I got like, even some of the people I follow, like on YouTube and stuff, a couple of them just died. That's what it would look like. And I've been watching a few sports related things because they're saying, talk about bringing hockey back, but not in front of crowds. That's crazy. Got a social distance. And uh, it's so funny watching them because their cognitive dissonance is so obvious. So there'll be like two reporters on from their houses with like really horrible hair because they haven't had a haircut in three months because they live up in Canada. <laughs> so they're like slaves. Here in Mexico, they just come to your house. It's fine. But uh, they'll say something like, Okay, they're planning on returning to hockey, but what happens if a player gets COVID or maybe even two or three? And instantly the response is, well, they just have to sit out for a little bit. <laughs> like no one goes, oh my gosh, if a couple of people and players got it, poor guys, they're gonna die. But no, they know, everyone knows, everyone knows. It's not gonna be life as they know it at the rink for NHL players, but I think that they, They've come up with a re it's not reasonable to shut down things if one or two people get sick with with this disease because this is a huge venture for them, huge business venture. But also because we know that people in this age group, if we're if we're looking at people who have risks from this disease, mm -hmm. they're they're very. This is a non-risk group. People in their twenties and thirties who are very very healthy. Um, this is, this isn't a group that, that is on your particular threat from this particular virus. If you're like in decent shape, you're not dying from whatever this thing is. And I don't think it's anything. And they even know that, but of course we can't have hockey. What if one person's grandma dies? Who was going to die anyway, by the way? <laughs> oh, well, I've got tons of crazy stuff today. There's no shortage of that. Lucy, Lucy Ben, don't go on the road. That's my girl. <laughs> in New York, uh, what a surprise. Half the crazy stuff's in New York. I don't know how anyone could ever live there. But uh, the, uh, the order followers, the criminals who uh, actually get paid from extortion, 
they call them police officers. All, uh, they put out this tweet. You gotta love this. It comes from uh, one of the police criminal chiefs. New Yorkers may begin to see our officers with black mourning bands across their shields and across their hearts. We wear these in quiet commemoration of our 27 brothers and sisters we've lost to the COVID. Another way we honor our vow to never forget. Yes, just honoring their 27 brothers and sisters who uh, died from COVID by covering up their name and badge numbers. You only have to look into the comments there to see a lot of people are like, uh, what? <laughs> so now the police have masks on and are covering up their name and badge numbers. And these are some of the most dangerous criminals in the world, especially in New York. Like, <laughs> so you've got basically a bunch of guys you can never identify going out and doing all kinds of crimes. And uh, speaking of that, in Asheville, North Carolina, here's some cops just helping out. Yeah, they found some uh, water bottles and uh, some medical supplies uh, that people were using. So, uh, you know, they did what any good law enforcer would do and uh, smash it all up. We will be enforcing the law. Please leave the area peacefully and you will not be harmed. Meanwhile, in Iowa, Des Moines, Iowa. Here's some people who are out protesting, apparently. I don't know. And they're in their apartment building. There's a woman holding her kid and a couple other people. And they're in the elevator. And uh, yeah, this is what you get if you protest now in the USSA. I shouldn't talk all bad about cops. Back in New York City, here's de Blasio's gang out actually helping people. So I have to, you know, every now and then I gotta show a good side. So here's the police helping out a bunch of looters. Some of them are tripping all over themselves. They couldn't see very well, so they, they helped them out with some flashlights. You're doing nothing. You're not even, oh shit. Yo, these niggas not even doing shit. That's fucking crazy. That's not, yo, that's crazy. Oh my God. Oh my goodness, bro. Hey, look at Tito. Tito. <laughs> yo, we out of here, bro. And here's a bunch of uh, criminals trying to kidnap a guy. And I just thought this was funny because, well, just watch and listen to the, the audio over top of it. Men's 100 meters, Usain Bolt will run in the seventh lane. He's the first Jamaican to win gold in the 100 meters. Previous winners, Jesse Owens, Harrison Dillard, Bob Hayes, Carl Lewis, Maurice Green, and Justin Gatlin himself, who appears once again here. He was the 2004 champion. And here comes Usain Bolt! Usain Bolt storming through! He takes it again! Blake gets the silver! 9.64! And we would talk a lot about Antifa and uh, Project Veritas did another amazing video. They did one interviewing uh, New York uh, coroners and uh, crematoriums and stuff. And they were saying there's nothing out of the ordinary happening. That was amazing journalism and they just put out another one. Uh, where they actually had a uh, one of their journalists infiltrate Antifa 
sort of meetings and very interesting stuff. I'll uh, play some of it here and I'll put the link down below. Uh, they reached out to me through Proton Mail, and we went back and forth and there was a, an, an interview set to meet up in Portland. So to verify that I was me, they had me wear a white shirt and have a water bottle and show up at a Starbucks where a person was going to ID me and approach me and asked who I was and I told them and I f followed them to the destination where the interview was going to be held. There uh, we went to a place called Imperial. They were getting this trade craft from someone else, someone with much more experience, someone who did this for her living. Caroline, which is the founder of RCA, moved to Sweden with her husband, who is a dual citizen. So there, there's a back and forth with a European connection. Rose City Antifa holds required lectures for prospecting members in secret at, in other words, bookstore before they open. And as part of their security culture, they require us to put our phones in the bathroom in next door. Uh, this bathroom is not only away from the main room where the lecture is taking place, but also has a fan that muffles any sound from the room. The whole goal of this, right, is to get out there and do dangerous things as safely as possible. How violent is Antifa or RCA in particular? Practice things like an eye gouge. It takes very little uh, pressure to injure someone's eyes. They do not hesitate to either push back or incite some kind of violence. In our classes and in our meetings, when, before we do uh, any sort of demonstration or black block, you know, we talk about weapons detail and what we carry and what we should have. What is black block? Well, this is black block right now. The term is used to uh, a tactic in which individuals conceal their identity to look uniform so, so that no one can be identified in an act of a crime. With RCA, it seems much more structured, almost like a company or like a business. So, you know, I feel like there is some type of outside funding influence or resources being used. Consider like destroying your enemy, not like delivering a really awesome right hand, right eye, left eye blow, you know? Um, it's not boxing, it's not kickboxing, it's like destroying your enemy. And who would have thought that our fascist, fascist future where there's brown shirts all over the place, making sure that no one breaks any of the thousands and thousands and thousands of laws in the land of the free would be Karen's. And I just had to play this because it's just too funny. They're playing. That's what the park is for. I never saw a car in here before. It's a, it's a power wheel car, man. It doesn't bother me. What bothers me is you have a little kid in here that doesn't have a driver's license. He's just a little kid and you're not with him. It's not a real car. Boy, she really wouldn't like it here in Mexico where I see like seven-year-old kids driving golf carts, racing them <laughs> all the time. But she would uh, probably call the, say that she's going to call the cops here and everyone would laugh and then probably tell her to move ASAP. <laughs> but I have to say something about Karens, these soccer moms that are going crazy. First of all, most of them, I think it's something like it's more than 20 or 30 percent, it might even be 50 percent of all women in the U.S. are on what they call antidepressants. These things are psychotic medications that actually make you basically insane, just so you know, especially if you stay on a lot of them. We have half the women in the U.S. on this stuff, not to mention for decades they've been told about feminism and how they should be like men and how they should be going out and working. And I'm not saying if you're a girl, you should or shouldn't, but this has been the agenda. And as they've done that, they've also demasculated a lot of the men through various ways. A lot of just removing their testosterone, using various things in the food, 
but also all kinds of propaganda on the mainstream media that has really turned men into not men anymore. So on top of that, you have these women who are trying to get ahead in the, in the work world and all those sort of things for decades. And then the men aren't really men anymore. So they start becoming more like men. And because they are, no guys are attracted to them. So that is actually a big part of why we're seeing this is all these women are so lost. It's sad. They don't even know what it's like to be a woman anymore. And uh, because they act so masculine and uh, crazy, <laughs> no man's attracted to them. So they're not getting any loving for like years or decades. And that is the result. What you just saw there and every other Karen. Like we should start a Get Karen's Laid charity or something. Probably wouldn't cost that much. There's a lot of guys out there who are, wouldn't, who'd probably do it almost for free anyway. But, you know, pay them a little bit so they act attracted to them. And, uh, and then maybe these, where's Lucy? Oh, there she is. Yeah, she's good. She knows when to cross the road. Yeah, I saw some uh, birds over here. Let's see how it goes. Ah, they're not running. They're not running. Uh, they're probably going to chase me. So, peace. Peace, guys. And now, of course, you can't even uh, go within six or seven feet of someone or go to their house in England. Oh, you poor people in England. What a slave state. I know the toll the lockdown has taken on families and friends who've been unable to see each other. So from Monday, we will allow up to six people to meet outside, provided those from different households continue strictly to observe social distancing rules by staying two meters apart. Yeah, this should really work out well. There should be no angry people after all this stuff. And there's no sports. <laughs> this is all done on purpose. They want everyone to go absolutely nuts. And to some extent they are. So they're getting what they want. And now they'll bring in the bigger police state, bring in the contact tracing. We're basically in East Germany times a hundred now in the U S anyway, here in Mexico is still good. And, uh, before we go on to the economic stuff, which is crazy, which is what I'm supposed to be talking about, but there's already so many other things to talk about that I have to mention. But before we do that, here's some cute birds. Yeah. Oh, look at this cutie. Yeah. There should be some baby. Oh, there's a, oh, there's a ton of babies now. Oh, he's so cute. He's so cute. What do you guys think of all this stuff? Uh, we just want to know where our mom is. Yeah, I'll bet. Hope you guys are okay. <laughs> but before we move on to the economic stuff, just talking about all this crazy police stuff. Murray Rothbard, who's one of the most important people in modern history, in my opinion. If you don't know who he is, look him up. And he wrote a book called, he's wrote, wrote many books, but he wrote one called Anatomy of the State. And in it, he talked about how you can tell if the police are there to protect you or to protect their, themselves and the people who uh, rule them, the people they really work for. And I think it's clear as day now, but I thought his quote here is very apropos for what's going on. Just in case you can't figure out what's going on, he says in his book, we may test the hypothesis that the state is largely interested in protecting itself rather than its subjects by asking which category of crimes does the state pursue and punish most intensely, those against private citizens or those against itself? That's all you need to know. So if people, I, I've actually heard some people, they're like, are cops not really on our side? It's like, no, <laughs> there might be a few sheriffs. Those ones are different. Um, they're a little better. But government cops? Are you crazy? Have you, you know, this is one thing that I'll give to uh, sort of black people here. Not that I'm not giving anything to black people. I totally, I want to help them by getting rid of the government and the central banks. But uh, I'll definitely give them this. They see way more of the horrors of government cops than any other sort of racial group that you can think of. 
So that's why rap music has been pretty angry now for 40 years. I don't know if you, you know, F the police. It wasn't just for fun. <laughs> it was like F the police. They're killing us out here. So a lot of other people back in the old days, I'm talking about like way back, like in January, when people still had jobs, still had businesses, and they were kind of like middle class kind of people. You didn't see too much of that. You'd be at your job all day. And, uh, you know, you drive home, you get extorted every now and then. They pull you over and you got a cracked taillight. You owe me 200 bucks. And you go, uh, it's pretty bad, but it's not that bad. But now that there is no middle class, the middle class just got wiped out. I don't know if you know. They didn't really announce it on TV yet. And <laughs> they probably never will. But yeah, it's wiped out now. So all of you middle class people, like those guys in Des Moines, Iowa, you're now finding out what it's like to live in sort of like black areas. And they're coming for everybody now. So <laughs> people better wise up pretty quick. But let's get into the economic stuff because this is just crazy. We are definitely, we're already in the greatest depression of all time. By all metrics, within a couple months, every single economic thing has done way worse than anything that from what the Federal Reserve caused in 1929 through to the 30s, where they put out all the propaganda that they saved it by putting in all these socialist things. It actually extended it. The U.S. was basically in a depression until after the war. And then they said, more propaganda, the war saved the economy. No, it didn't. It destroyed the economy again. But eventually, everything was just wrecked and uh, they started building up. And back then in the U.S., there wasn't that much government involvement in everything. There was hardly any regulations on anything. Not much police. Well, there's no police state really at all. And... Um, the Federal Reserve was still restricted till the 1970s in printing too much money. So, yeah, it, basically the market built itself back up after that, but it took about 20 years and it wasn't saved by socialism. That's actually what's destroying a big part of the U.S. right now. And it wasn't saved by wars. Explain to me how uh, blowing up huge chunks of the world and getting blown up yourself improves the economy, Krugman. And of course, he'll use his Keynesian. Well, the GDP goes up. Uh, GDP is a meaningless figure. If you destroy everything, it'd be like if you lived on an island, right? And there was another guy on the other side of the island. And instead of trading with each other, you decided to go to war with each other. And you burnt down his house. He burnt down your house. He attacked you and stabbed you. You had to go back. And once you got better, you went back and stabbed him. After all that's over, did that help the economy? <laughs> it's very basic. But uh, they don't teach economics in government schools or even in universities. Only Mises University do they teach actual economics. So most people don't know this. But we're now, while the U.S. government, again, this is just unbelievable. They're just printing up trillions and trillions. If you don't know, even when Donald Trump signed the first trillion dollar stimulus, he was like, I've never signed anything with a T on it before, ha ha, while the evil ass people behind them all grinned and they're like, oh, we're getting our money. But the fact is that no one has ever, ever signed anything with a T on it ever before. I guess the closest would be in the 2008 financial crisis, but no one actually did a stimulus bill that big as far as I remember. Was it a trillion? No, I don't think so. I'd have to look it up. But... U.S. government is just printing trillions and trillions and, and well, not actually printing, the Federal Reserve is, but they're spending trillions and trillions and the Federal Reserve is printing up trillions and trillions and buying up the U.S. government debt with it. And they now say they're coming out with another trillion dollar. And just look at this chart. And this chart doesn't show most of the stimulus bills yet. This is the federal government spending in billions of dollars. This is it all the way back to the year 2000. It was kind of like... 100 billion, 200, got up to 300, 400. We just hit, actually it was just right around 400 right before this. Now trillions. <laughs> and that is going to destroy the economy unbelievably. No one has any idea how badly this is going to destroy everything. And we're, that's what's next. So get ready. 
And the unemployment in the US is mind boggling. It's now over 42 million people unemployed. I don't know how many people actually work like actual employees in the US. I would be very surprised if it's over 100 million. A lot of people are sort of 18 and under. They're not even allowed to work anymore thanks to all the government regulations. And then many of them go stupidly, which I've been saying, hey, you guys gonna be enjoying your uh, college degree after this? Yeah, you'll just be in the camps. That's what I've been saying for years. But up until like 25 or even 30, most of them are just in the colleges wasting their time and money. And then there's people working from like 25 to, you know, 60 or whatever it is. And then there's lots of older people who are just retired on their pensions, which are now about to uh, disappear. This should be fun. So I don't know for sure, but I can't imagine the amount of employed people in the US is much over 125 million. I guess maybe it could be 150 million. I didn't look it up. In any case, there's almost 50 million unemployed now, which if my guesses are correct, is like half the people or more in the US. And I saw this sign, this is a great sign. Flatten the curve of unemployment. Well, unlike this fake virus, which you can just make up whatever numbers you want, you can't really just flatten the curve of unemployment. Once all these businesses go under, and we're seeing that now with airlines, uh, they're not allowed to lay off anyone until September in the US, and they get all kinds of funds for that. But it's, they're just wasting their funds. They're flying empty planes all the time. Talk about a waste of time and money. And uh, they've already said when they get back to uh, when they're allowed to lay off people, they're going to be laying off quite a few people. I heard 30% uh, from some of the airlines. So they're not coming back. Those jobs aren't coming back anytime soon. They could if the government went away and the Federal Reserve went away and everyone started using crypto. Within a year or two, we'd be back to actually, we'd, be, we'd have the best economy of ever in history because it'd be with sound money without any government involvement. But most of these jobs aren't coming back. So, especially like restaurant jobs and stuff like that. When I hear, I've been hearing so many horror stories about there's a few restaurants reopening in the US now. In fact, in Canada, I heard about one uh, north of Toronto. They got fined $500,000 for opening. They're just destroying any small business right now. And I hear about if you go to the US, they can only have like one third the capacity. Oh yeah, they were barely surviving before with all the taxes and regulations. This, they're all gonna be dead. The waitresses all got masks on. They're all standing way far apart at you. Some of them are even asking you for your information so that they can contact trace you. And not to mention, there might be a guy in the restaurant eating with a Pac-Man mask. Oh yeah, hey Jeff, you wanna go out for dinner? No, I want out of here. I'll be down here. I'll just eat in my house if I have to. I don't want to do any of that crap. Not to mention people yelling at you. I even had my own people at TDV say he was in Connecticut. Commie cut, he calls it. And uh, you're supposed to wear a mask. Not when you're inside the restaurant, but when you go outside, from the time you go outside to the time you get to your table, you're supposed to wear a mask. When you get to the table, government rules here, okay? You could take the mask off. So you have to wear it for about five seconds. And my person who actually does a lot of stuff for these videos <laughs> told me he didn't want to do it. And they flipped out and uh, threw him out of the restaurant and told him never to come back. And he's been going there for years. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm sure a lot of the restaurants will be coming right back. The only way a lot of this stuff comes right back is if all this stuff ends immediately. If people realize it's a scam, it's a hoax. Uh, but even then, the economic, this is going to be brutal. You guys worried about the Great Depression? No, just waiting for mom. Okay, Lucy loves the babies. Yeah, I got no problem with babies. I just like chasing some of the smaller birds. But to finish up, 
at the World Economic Forum, they've actually come out and said that they're basically using this crisis, which is all planned, to do the Great Reset. They even have a website for it, weforum.org slash great hyphen reset. And James Corbett actually did it again. If you don't know him, subscribe to his channel. Uh, subscribe on his website so you get all this stuff. Uh, did another great video on it. I'll play just a couple minutes of it here to show you that this is what they've been planning. So they basically want to tear down what we know of as capitalism, which is actually, we've never had capitalism. Uh, capitalism's only in the black market, which is the free market. Uh, but, you know, you don't have central banks in capitalism. You don't have taxes in capitalism. Uh, but uh, th what they're saying is this crony capitalism, uh, they want to get rid of it and bring in basically socialism, communism worldwide. Oh, we got a cute little, it's like a wiener dog with hair. <laughs> Hello. Hello. What are you doing, Lucy? Anyway. Oh, there goes Lucy. <laughs> Lucy wants to say hi. What are you doing, Lucy? <laughs> Lucy, Adios. Adios. <laughs> Lucy, Lucy, vamos. All right. Let's play the uh, World Economic Forum video. So, as, as you're basically teeing it up right on time, Brave New World Order minions all start moving their grand chessboard pieces. Of course, never letting a crisis go to waste, which I believe is the caption to the photo on the World Economic Forum website, which features the post, Now is the Time for a Great Reset. This, written by Klaus Schwab, Executive Chairman of the World Economic Forum, and of course, a Bilderberger who was even on their steering committee at one point. He writes, quote, We need a great reset of capitalism. The Great Reset Agenda would have three main components. The first would steer the market toward fairer outcomes. Depending on the country, these may include changes to wealth taxes, the withdrawal of fossil fuel subsidies, and new rules governing intellectual property, trade, and competition. The second component of a Great Reset Agenda would ensure that investments advance shared goals such as equality and sustainability. Rather than using US, EU, Asia funds, as well as investments from private entities and pension funds to fill cracks in the old system, which they do and will continue to do anyway, we should use them to create a new one that is more resilient, equitable, and sustainable in the long run. This means, for example, building green urban infrastructure and creating incentives for industries to improve their track record on environmental, social, and governance metrics. And they can improve those by, of course, lying about it and rigging up the numbers as we've reported many years ago about Volvo and the great, of course, emissions scandal. The third and final priority, of the Great Reset Agenda is to harness the innovations of the Fourth Industrial Revolution, which just so happens to be the name of this guy's book. And that's gonna support the public good. During the COVID-19 crisis, companies, universities, and others have joined forces to develop diagnostics, therapeutics, and possible vaccines, establishing testing centers, create mechanisms for tracing infections, and deliver telemedicine. Imagine what could be possible if similar concerted efforts were made in every sector." End quote. So I found a couple of interesting, just very easy to find examples of The Great Reset being around for at least the last dozen or so years. A 2010 book by a guy named Richard Florida. Yeah, Dick Florida. The Great Reset. How new ways of living and working drive post-crash prosperity. He runs the Atlantic.com now. But an even earlier sci-fi series, of course, by a writer named Sean McKnight called Second Renaissance. Started online in 2007. They've got a whole entry on wiki of basically the future history of the Great Reset, 2009 to 2027. And I mean, they really kind of already kind of kind of at it, James. And again, in a lot of these situations, they're just kind of uh, announcing it to us, right? It, in a sense, it is just putting it out on the table and putting it in black and white. And it's interesting how he does this in this article. I hope people will go and read through it in its entirety. But he starts by basically saying, you know, we're in crisis, everything's falling apart. We must build entirely new foundations for our economic and social systems. The level of cooperation and ambition this implies is unprecedented, but it is not some impossible dream. In fact, one silver lining of the pandemic is that it has shown how quickly we can make radical changes to our lifestyles. 
Almost instantly, the crisis forced businesses and individuals to abandon practices long claimed to be essential from frequent air travel to working in an office. I mean, this is social engineering 101 type of stuff that generally I would have to do some sort of propaganda watch to put it out on the table. You see, they're putting you through the crisis in order to re-engineer and a society in the way that, well, he's coming out and saying it. This is the perfect opportunity for us to re-engineer society. So yeah, people used to ask me why I go to Bilderberg and all that. Uh, I used to quite a bit. Um, and they said, what are you trying to do? It's like trying to expose what these guys are doing. That guy from the World Economic Forum used to build a Bilderberg uh, chairman, basically. <laughs> that's what they're planning. And that's what you're trying to expose on them. And people are like, oh, you guys, you know, wasting your time trying to, they're just talking in there. It's just a bunch of the richest people in the world all talking. And, you know, they talk about good stuff, you know, like the good club, how to, uh, you know, like Bill Gates, how he's going to save everyone. And I'm like, no, that's not what they're talking about. Um, <laughs> and now we're seeing exactly all their plans roll out. If you look back, imagine making a bet six months ago. And you can make a bet with someone and go, I'll bet you in six months, and everything's fine at the time. Everyone's going to sports games. They're all at the bars and restaurants. They all got jobs. Everything's fine. They're saying on the news that uh, buy stocks, you know, it's a great time to buy stocks. Trump's like, yeah, we're heading towards 30,000 on the Dow. It's the best economy of our life, which it wasn't. It was all lies. It has, it's been downhill since, for a long time, actually, but definitely since 2008. But anyway, so everything's kind of like how, you know, remember the, uh, the good old days in January? Making a bet. I'll bet you that almost half the people in the U.S. are unemployed in like four months and I'll bet they're all locked in their house under martial law. And in fact, most places in the world, martial law worldwide, the economy's almost down to zero. Uh, and uh, <laughs> Federal Reserve's printing up like $10 trillion. Anyone in the world would have said I was insane. And of course I didn't say that was gonna happen, but I was saying this was coming. I didn't even know, I, this is already way crazier than I thought it could get. I didn't know they had this much control. Look how quickly they've destroyed the whole world in just a couple months and they have people begging for it. There's Karens out there yelling at people to get back in their house. <laughs> oh my God. Well, what can you do? I just want to let you know as well, we have a new channel, it's called TDB Clips. We've already had two del videos deleted off of it. <laughs> what a surprise. But if you like some of the stuff in these videos, check it the next day and we have them kind of like cut up into different segments because some people want, like for example, sometimes we have a good uh, song or something at the start. And if you just want to share that, uh, we'll have that on the TDB Clips channel, that's down below. And definitely uh, subscribe to Lucy's channel. Uh, so our, our V for Medetta uh, video is still up there. It was leave it, deleted after four hours on our channel. Oh, it's still up? Oh, that's good. I, I guess those idiots are not very smart but yeah check out my channel it's lucy and jeff show i've got a lot of exclusive content about tacos and kishes and apples and all my dog friends at how at the house and uh yeah if they ever delete uh, uh jeff's videos then uh i throw them up on my channel screw them no vitamin t today lucy but i got some carny Moving for you.